when the Space Shuttle Columbia attempted to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere after a successful 16-day mission in space, no one knew the shuttle carried a fatal flaw which would cause it to disintegrate over North Texas. Or did they? This is the story of the Columbia Shuttle Disaster. The Space Shuttle program was initially conceived in the late 1960s, with the final designs being presented to the public in the mid-1970s. In its 30-year history of flight, the Space Shuttle program has seen exhilarating highs and some devastating lows. From 1981 through to 2011, there were a total of 135 flights, with 355 different crew from 16 different countries, and the shuttle docked nine times on the Russian space station and helped with the construction of the International Space Station. Composed of an orbiter launched with two reusable solid rocket boosters and a disposable external fuel tank, the NASA space shuttles were designed to provide reliable, reusable and cost-effective space flight. However, with constant launch delays and price tags reaching up to $1 billion per launch, the Space Shuttle program was often under pressure to deliver on this promise. And further doubt would be cast upon the program when, in January of 1986, just five years into the program, a defective rubber o-ring led to the explosion of Challenger 73 seconds after launch, killing all seven astronauts aboard. But despite these setbacks, public support remained strong and NASA would continue with the program. Having first flown in 1981, Columbia was the oldest of the five shuttles, having spent more than 300 days in space and orbiting the Earth more than 4,000 times. On January the 16th, 2003, onlookers gathered near the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, eagerly awaiting the 28th launch of the Space Shuttle Columbia. Plagued with technical difficulties, the launch had been cancelled 18 times and was now more than two years behind schedule. At 10.39am on launch pad 39A, Columbia was ready for liftoff in what was almost near perfect conditions for launch. 3, 2, 1, we have booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Columbia with a multitude of national and international space research experiments. Houston now controlling the flight of Columbia, the international research mission finally underway. Roger roll, Columbia. Commanding the mission was Rick Husband, a US Air Force colonel and mechanical engineer. Piloting alongside him was William McCall, a US Navy commander. The payload specialists included Michael Anderson, a US Air Force lieutenant colonel and physicist, and Elan Rahman, the first Israeli to go to space. The mission specialists were Dr. Kalpana Chala, aerospace engineer, on her second flight to space, as well as David Brown and Laurel Clark, both former Navy captain and flight surgeons. Unlike most space shuttle missions, Columbia's 28th flight was designed to be one of 24-hour scientific experiments. As such, the seven-member crew were split into two shifts for around-the-clock operations. Over the course of the next 16 days, the crew performed 80 scientific experiments, including that of live fish in a small aquarium, monitoring dust storms back on Earth, and testing how bacteria behaved in space. Flight day 16 was the final day for science. However, much of the day was spent preparing Columbia for its return to Earth the following day. Preparations for landing would begin early on the final morning, with landing simulations performed by Commander Rick Husband and Pilot William McCall. By 8am, the crew were suited up and completing their final checks. Engine ignition would begin with the shuttle orbiting almost 100 miles above the Indian Ocean. And at 8.45am, the shuttle started entering the Earth's atmosphere around 350,000 feet above Hawaii. Travelling at 28,000 km per hour and facing heat up to 1600 degrees Celsius, entering the Earth's atmosphere is one of the most dangerous parts of the flight.
by 8.49 a.m., Mission Control in Houston began to receive the first indications that something might be wrong with the shuttle, with dangerously high heat readings from a number of onboard sensors, most notably the left wing of the shuttle. FYI, I've just lost four separate uh, temperature transducers on the left side of the vehicle, the hydraulic return temperatures. Four hide return temps? To the left outboard and left inboard elevons. They're, all the, four of them are located in the uh, aft part of the left wing, right in front of the elevons, elevon actuators. And there okay. is no commonality. No commonality. Hydraulic return instrumentations. Uh, no, sir, there's not. We've also lost the uh, nose gear down talk back and the right main gear down talk back. Columbia Houston, com check. Columbia Houston, UHF, com check. Final one, you expecting tracking? One minute ago, flight. As mission control tried in vain to raise the shuttle, onlookers across North Texas were already witnessing the final moments of the flight. Columbia had broken up 200,000 feet above Texas, killing all seven astronauts aboard. In the aftermath of the disaster, the big question was, what went wrong with Columbia? Some engineers at NASA believed they already knew, and the trouble had begun at launch 16 days earlier. During shuttle liftoff, the reusable solid rocket boosters provide the majority of the power required to get to space. Additional power is supplied by the shuttle's three main engines, and during the shuttle's 8 minute ascent to space, the engines burn more than 500,000 gallons of fuel, all of which is provided by the orange external fuel tank strapped to the underside of the shuttle. The external fuel tank is covered by foam panels that act as a thermal protection system to reduce ice buildup and to protect it from the external heat from the burning rocket fuel. On day two of the mission, NASA had reviewed the launch footage, which, on close inspection, showed a large piece of the insulation foam from the external fuel tank breaking off and striking the left wing of the orbiter. However, this caused no major concern at NASA. Foam strikes on launch had been a frequent occurrence on several launches. While Columbia's crew performed their experiments in space, unaware of the foam strike, NASA had conducted several top-level meetings to discuss the issue. Despite concerns from some NASA engineers, management were convinced the lightweight foam posed no significant risk. NASA engineer Don McCormick Jr. claimed that Linda Hamm, the chairwoman of the mission management team, repeatedly cut him off when he tried to raise the issue. NASA aerospace engineer Rodney Rocher wrote two emails requesting surveillance satellites take images of the shuttle to check for damage. However, Hamm and her team did not take these requests seriously. Senior engineers advising Hamm concluded that the foam strike might cause severe localized heat damage on re-entry, but did not pose a catastrophic threat to the flight, and as such, no further action was required. Led by US Navy Admiral Harold Gaiman, the Columbia Accident Investigation Board was set up almost immediately after the disaster. Gaiman and his team immediately began honing in on the foam strike having caused critical damage to the wing theory despite there still being strong doubts at NASA as to the ability of foam to actually cause damage. To test the theory, the team set up an experiment to fire a one and a half pound piece of foam at the leading edge of a shuttle's reinforced carbon wing. There were audible gasps from the crowd nearly 100 in attendance, including NASA astronauts. When the foam fired at more than 500 miles per hour, smashed a hole more than 16 inches wide into the leading edge of the wing, thus confirming that the foam strike on launch was, 
indeed responsible for the loss of Columbia and her seven crew. Investigators concluded that in the flight's final moments, extreme heat penetrated the hole in the left wing, destroying its internal structures, causing the shuttle to veer out of control before finally breaking apart. A report stated that Columbia's crew died either from lack of oxygen during depressurization or hitting something as the shuttle spun violently out of control. In August of 2003, the investigation team released its 248-page report into the cause of the accident. The report highlighted bureaucratic inertia, the increased acceptance of risk, and systemic flaws at the top levels of NASA as a major cause of the accident. It also stated that, if significant changes were not made, the floor was set for another disaster. The last three shuttles would remain grounded until July of 2005, and they would be completely retired after the completion of the International Space Station in 2011.